very, very well. Oh, and see you later. Population Health Spotlight series. Um, I'm honored today to be able to introduce uh, today's speaker, Dr. David Michaels. Um, Dr. Michaels is uh, currently a professor of environmental and occupational health at the Milliken Institute uh, School of Public Health at George Washington University. He told me that I didn't say the whole thing. <laughs> um, uh, Dr. Michaels earned his MPH and PhD from Columbia University. Uh, he's an epidemiologist um, and has extensive experience in uh, both academia and research as well as in government service. Uh, specifically, Dr. Michael served uh, most recently as the U.S. Assistant Secretary of Labor for the Occupational, for Occupational Safety and Health um, throughout the almost entire Obama administration. Um, in so doing, he became the longest serving OSHA head in, in our history. Uh, notably, under his leadership, OSHA updated its occupational injury and uh, illness surveillance requirements, important to those of us who are epidemiologists. Um, and he also issued new health standards protecting workers from exposure to silica and beryllium, and new safety regulations uh, that protected workers from uh, falls, confined spaces, and other hazards. Uh, Dr. Mike has also served as the Department of Energy's Assistant Secretary for Environment, Safety, and Health during uh, the latter years of the Clinton administration, uh, where he was responsible for health and safety of uh, nuclear weapons workers, uh, as well as uh, communities uh, in the vicinity of those facilities. He was the architect of the Energy Employees Occupational Illness and Compensation Fund, uh, which uh, has provided billions of dollars in health benefits to uh, nuclear weapons workers. Dr. Michaels has been a leader in the fight to protect the integrity of science um, that underpins public health and environmental protection. He's the author of the book, Doubt is Their Product, How Industries Assault on Science and Threatens Your Health, which was published by Oxford, Oxford University Press in 2008. And he's uh, the author of a soon to be released, released book called The Triumph of Doubt, Dark Money and the Science of Deception. Uh, one review of this new book states, quote, David Michaels is that rare combination, the fearless expert. He not only knows where the bodies are buried, he knows who buried them. That's a quote from Dan Fagan, who's a Pulitzer Prize winning uh, author uh, of Tom's River and others. Uh, uh, Professor Michaels has earned several prestigious awards for his work, including the Scientific Freedom and Responsibility Award from the American Association of Science, the David P. Rawl Award for Advocacy in Public Health from the APHJ, and the John P. Mendoza Science and Society Award from the Sigma Psi of the Scientific Research Society. So we are really privileged to have Dr. Michaels here today. So please welcome Dr. Michaels. Thank you so much. It's really great to be here. Um, I appreciate this invitation and this is a wonderful opportunity for me to talk about things that I think are really uh, challenging and important, which is this question of scientific concern. And you know, we in public health know that many questions that we ask can't be answered absolutely perfectly. Um, we don't do randomized clinical trials on air pollution or um, occupational exposure for lots of reasons that we go into. So there's always uncertainty in how we're going to protect the public. And I think one of the challenges that we face in public health is, is understanding uncertainty, separating out real from artificial uncertainty, or what I call manufactured uncertainty, I'll we'll get to that, um, and understanding that the basic principle of protecting the public is to make decisions on the basis of the best available evidence. So with that in mind, let me dive in here a little bit and talk about uh, some of these issues about uh, uncertainty and decision making. So I'm going to begin with a, a couple of Exposures that this book that, that you've heard about um, was funded by a bunch of foundations and the Penn University that paid for me to do it. Um, I have been involved in some uh, litigation involved since leaving OSHA when you work for the federal government at my level. I couldn't work for anybody else, but since then, since January 2017, you may remember something that happened then. Uh -huh. Trump and Trudeau right left. Um, 
There have been six legal cases, three on the side of the plaintiffs, three on the side of the defendants. And I can testify as a fact witness in this uh, talc ovarian cancer case, um, which I'll talk about in a little bit, but it's a little interesting. So this was, and I received no compensation for that testimony. But I did get some great stories out there. Um, so as you heard, I wrote this book 12 years ago, um, which I wrote really was sort of inspired to write after I was in the Clinton administration. And I issued a regulation for beryllium, which is a very important product component to making nuclear weapons. And we made people sick from beryllium disease who were exposed to beryllium in the factories where we make nuclear weapons. Um, and we issued a very strong standard. But over the opposition of the beryllium industry, they hired some uh, scientists to say that really the science was uncertain. We were able to overcome that, but when I looked at this, I saw there was a, a larger pattern of corporations hiring what I call corrupt scientists to essentially manufacture scientific uncertainty. So I wrote this book, and that was 2008. Um, I then uh, went to the government. There was some question about whether I would be confirmed by the Senate by uh, having written a book like this, but no one's like the president. Um, <laughs> and so I was confirmed by the Senate, and I read, was, uh, they had a motion for seven plus years under President Obama. It was a wonderful experience. I'm not going to be talking about that today. It's a little bit of so my new book. It's, it's a whole different discussion. And it's really, you have the opportunity to work for the federal government in the public publications. And I highly recommend it. Um, but when I came out of OSHA, I really looked around what was going on in the world. Um, I had actually planned to focus primarily on uh, still advocating for worker safety. But what I saw was that it's now standard operating procedure for corporations to manufacture scientific uncertainty about their potential harms of their products. The, uh, some of the, the same people and the issues that I saw previously, I thought had become even more widespread and were beyond some of the sort of occupational environmental chemicals that I've written about previously, but were much more, I saw that in, in um, the industries that produce alcohol and beverages, that uh, produce foods and sugar sweet beverages, uh, automobiles, even the National Football League when faced with clearly evidence that the trauma that uh, football players undergo was really destroying their brains in many cases. The disease we now call chronic traumatic encephalopathy. The NFL hired their own doctors to say, no, it's not real. So I thought I should write a book about that. And so uh, coming out in two weeks, this is my first book talk really, uh, The Triumph of Doubt, Dark Money, and the Science of Deception. There's a little card if you want to buy it discounted from Oxford. Uh, Amazon. Um, and that's the book. Um, of course, it all takes back to tobacco. The model, when we think about this, and when I frame it, tobacco use will understand it. You know, even before the, the studies showing the relationship of tobacco and lung cancer, the tobacco industry understood that they needed to make sure people thought it was safe. Because people could see that if, you put, if you're pulling this stuff into your lungs, it has an effect on people. So in the early days, even before those studies came up, um, you know, the tobacco industry was trying to convince you, as a potential smoker, that cigarettes were safe, right? But they faced a much more serious problem. When the studies came out in 1950, that cigarette smoke increased risk of lung cancer, of course, three case control studies, and a different problem. They had to convince you that, in fact, the science wasn't adequate. So they made a commitment to more research, but really what they did was they tried to essentially cause confusion. Like one of the things they did, which I have always enjoyed, they put out this um, monthly report on tobacco and health research, um, which went out to scientists and physicians all over the country. And the memos that all came out because of the litigation against the tobacco industry said, what we have to do here is emphasize anything that doesn't, that suggests that something other than cigarettes cause lung cancer. This was, of course, um, my favorite here. Um, lung cancer, rare and old men. Well, I'm sure it's not a particular one to show you. But there's lots more. It's all on file. Um, now, that worked for a while. Um, eventually, we learned from these documents exactly what was going on. And this is the famous memo from Brown and Williamson, one of the tobacco companies. They all, I don't generally like to read everything. It's all there. But doubt is our product. That's what they wrote. Not tobacco. Doubt is our product. It's the best means of competing with the body of tobacco exists in the minds of the general public. It's the means of establishing conflicts. And that's what they did for many years. And they continued to do it until, essentially, the studies showed that uh, non-smoking spouses of tobacco, of smokers, 
where he grew some blood cancer. Then they really had to up, it, up their, their game and they took this on and it really worked for a long time. But they, you know, eventually they all had to give in and say, yes, we really do acknowledge that tobacco smoking causes um, blood cancer, heart disease, etc. But they got decades of you know, really excessive profits selling an addictive product by doing this campaign. Now this same approach though is not just limited to tobacco. The only one that's very well known that I'm not going to talk about but I do book some is of course around climate change. It's the same approach. Um, if you read Naomi Resky's book, Merchants of Doubt, it's even some of the same people who did that. Um, this is a, a memo from Frank Luntz. Anyone ever see Frank Luntz on Fox News? He's a sort of a wordsmith. He tells you not what uh, you say but what, what people hear. And he wrote this memo to the Republican Party saying, um, how to win the, climbing, cl the global warming debate. This was still what was called global warming. The scientific debate would make open. Voters believe there's no consensus about global warming within the scientific community. Voters believe that. They believe that because they're being told that by six people funded by the petroleum industry. Should the public come to believe the scientific issues are settled, their view about global warming will change. Therefore, you need to continue to make lack of science with certainty a primary issue. And that went on for years. And you know, the, there were publications like this that went out every high school teacher in the country, things like that. Well, for a long time. And now that's beginning to change. The oil industry has finally, if you watched the debate last night, they, they actually uh, put commercials up saying, yes, we know climate change is happening. We want to be part of the solution. But they, you know, they caused the problem. I'm going to put that aside. Those are the two most well-known examples. I see this much more widely. Do you remember Enron? Who remembers Enron? So Enron was a company was built essentially the house of cards. It didn't really, they didn't do anything. They were trading energy futures, but the whole thing was fake. And when it collapsed, thousands of people lost their pensions. A few people made a tremendous amount of money. It, what I call what's going on is like the Enronization of science. Um, you have this whole industry where scientists were hired to defend products or activities. Their product defense, they call themselves product defense. That's their phrase, not mine, product defense. Their value is to influence regulation and litigation. It's not to produce science. The product defense industry, you know, they will write lots of papers, and you've seen, you've seen the papers, but the point isn't to better understand the world, which is why we do science, but to defend a product or an industry. Their science is really of questionable value, I believe. Um, this was uh, something I found on the web. I, I enjoyed the surf. One of the companies, uh, how they market themselves, um, to the corporations, scare people are trying to watch out for scare signs, the loss of presumptive innocence. So that's this basic idea which you have to think about. Are chemicals innocent until proven guilty? Right? And that's the presumptive that's the we have the concept of presumptive innocence is a concept of criminal law in the United States. People are innocent until they're proven guilty. So the way the manufacturers of chemicals and other dangerous products frame this is You've got to show that my chemical is dangerous before we should do anything about it. That's presumptive innocence. And that's a terrible frame, obviously, and not one that protects the public health. It's the ultra, well, another way to call that is the body and the morgue method. Only when you show that people are being hurt, you do it. Um, so one of the things I did uh, more recently was I went on to the um, glass door. You know, you've all seen the glass door, but if you want to go work in a place, you look it up. And I read the comments written by some of the from people who work for these companies that do this work, this product defense work. I mean, here are a couple of quotes I found from Cardinal Chemrisky. So one person wrote, this is a law consulting company, not a science consulting company. Don't expect to be a scientist. <laughs> or a gradient uh, up in Cambridge, they look like they're scientists. But some of the principal scientists have questionable ethics and be pulled out for it. Or exponents sometimes will be working for the evildoers and trying to make it seem like they did nothing wrong. So those are the people who work for them who said that. Um, and a, a very well-known example of um, Arthur Brent maybe uh, may have commented on this. Exponent and Kemper's were both hired by Ford for being sued around asbestos coming out of bricks, and they spent $40 million paying these companies to do studies to show and publish them in the peer review literature, saying that whatever the exposure was, it wasn't real, the risk was low, etc. But the, these studies are, are pre have preordained results. Because if you have a company and your business model is being hired by corporations to give them reports that they can use to defend themselves, you're not going to give them reports that they can't use to defend themselves. You go out of business. So the business model is very straightforward. 
we need you to say something. We're going to give you a report back that says that. Now, within the scientific world, we sometimes call that the funding effect, which is a nicer way to put it. And there are a lot of studies that have done that show that there's a close correlation between the results desired of the study sponsor and the results that are reported. And we've seen pharmaceuticals, we've seen a lot of chemicals. It may not, in some of these cases, it may not be specifically, we need this result, but that's the result that always happens in the funding effect. So this was a recent one, and I could give you dozens of papers on it. But this was on e-cigarettes. I'm sure people are shocked to know that if an e-cigarette study company paid for a study, um, it was much more likely to show that there was no negative health impact from e-cigarettes. I know that's surprising. Um, an all-around sense of the work. I, I found this on the web. I wrote about it in Scientific American. They took it down from the web. I saved the, the shot. And this is just really a, an example worth sort of uh, really sort of synthesizing, understanding. So the FDA uh, licenses or, or gives essentially authority for to companies to sell drugs. You have to be able to sell a drug. You have to show that it is at least effective to some extent and that it's Benefits has benefits more than the um, than the uh, harms that it causes. Every drug causes harm. Right? Drugs are biologically active. None of them are, are are actually safe. But the FDA has to weigh that out. The FDA cancels drugs for only two reasons. One is if the drug doesn't work, they'll cancel the drug. Or if the harms greatly outweigh the possible benefits. So if you have a drug that's you know not very important in terms of a, a health effect. But Tell you, they basically take off the market. So here's one of these companies that, that put, to advertise their, their product, they said, the FDA proposed cancellation of the registered drug. Cancellation requires an administrative hearing. This group, the one group, was retained by two manufacturers that drug under attack to define strategy for the administrative hearing, identify experts, assist in preparation, blah, 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 preparation, cross-examination. This led to an extensive process with a written appeal from the first decision of the commissioner into 10 additional years of sales prior to the ultimate cancellation of the drug. So they got to sell this drug for 10 years before the, before the FDA finally was able to force it off the market. And they're boasting about this. So that's an older example. I want to talk about one that's much hotter right now, one that we think about all the time, which is uh, diesel engine emissions. This is a couple of chapters in my book. And I think it's really sort of fascinating. So we all know about diesel engines. They put out um, quite a few different uh, chemicals, uh, many of which are associated with uh, heart disease and cancer. Uh, yeah. um, carbon monoxide, and obviously we're concerned about uh, greenhouse gases, but uh, uh, nitrogen oxides, sulfur oxides, particulate matter, they all come out of diesel engines. The diesel engine industry, companies like Cummings, who work very hard to make these safe to reduce exposures because these exposures are associated with a tremendous number of premature deaths all across the world. In fact, this was a work done by a colleague of mine, GW Susan Edinburgh, with the number of premature deaths attributable to on-road diesel vehicles, just from, now this is only from the, the NOx part, the NOx emissions, not from the particulates. And so this is um, annually about 107,000 deaths. So when we clean up diesel engines, we can make it really have a very important public health impact all across the world. Now, uh, in 2012, scientists associated with the National Cancer Institute and the National Institute for Occupational Safety published a couple of studies looking at relationship of particulates, diesel particulates. This is not the nitrogen, but the little black particles uh, that often have other things attached to them, and lung cancer. And it was an interesting study they did. It's very hard to study the effect of diesel particulates in people who are exposed on the street because we're exposed to all these other things. But they found seven mines, deep underground mines, which produced trona and a couple of different pretty safe substances where the only significant exposure of any carcinogen, potential carcinogen, was from the, the huge diesel engines that are on the mining machines. So they, were, they looked at underground miners, and the study took about 12 years or more to do because the industry tried to slow the study down, and it's a different story. 
But they finally issued these two studies simultaneously. One was from real NIOSH, one from NCI, one was a, a cohort study, it was a case group study. They both showed the same thing. In fact, not surprisingly, diesel engine exhaust particulates increase risk of lung cancer. So at that point, the International Agency for Research on Cancer convened the panel and they said, this is a carcinogen, this is a lung carcinogen. They reviewed all the literature, they make perfect sense, there's tons of animal data, there was actually a study of uh, truck drivers. They looked at it all together, they said, this is a category one human carcinogen. So how did the diesel industry respond? Not by saying, yes, we have to clean up. They um, hired a number of, of scientists to question, to review the literature, do what I call strategic literature reviews. Where you essentially, you can review the literature when you come up with a different conclusion. That's not hard to do. You say, well, this study is not as good as that study. They did, so they did a few of these. Um, eventually, they were able to get the raw data from that the diesel exhaust uh, study, mining study, and um, they got the raw data and they reanalyzed it, and then they reanalyzed it again. They came to these. And each time they did this, they, they essentially said that the results weren't true. And you know, reanalysis for an epidemiologist is, you know, it's pretty easy. Give me the raw data for a positive study, I can make it negative. And I can give you a dozen examples of people who've done that. You change around the exposure assessments, you change the cutoffs, because you know what the result is going to be, and you can make the results disappear. And they don't, it, a, a reanalysis isn't, it doesn't, shouldn't get equal weight as an epidemiologic study that you do from scratch where you put out your prior hypotheses, you say, this is the, the methods where I use, where I follow these methods. And we're going to see what the results are. Because a post hoc analysis, you can get the opposite result. But what industry wants you to think is these are equal and opposite studies. There's too much uncertainty, we shouldn't go forward. And that's what they tried to do in this case. But um, you know, mostly people just said, well, no, that's a, a reanalysis that we don't really take seriously. Um, and there wasn't really an attempt to, to issue new standards for diesel exhaust. But, um, the fact that it was a carcinogen really did make people look much more carefully at these engines. And one group that really had to look more carefully at these engines, these engines was Volkswagen. Because Volkswagen was attempting to become the world's number one car dealer, and they decided they would do this through a new type of diesel engine. You know, and diesel in Europe is actually subsidized, it's a little cheaper, um, and you get great performance from a diesel engine. You know, you know, faster acceleration. The problem with diesel engines is it puts out diesel exhaust. Um, but uh, Volkswagen came up with the clean diesel, and they did a, a huge amount of, of, of uh, publicity. Does everyone know what that is? Is it clean? Right? Um, anyway, these are just a few of their commercials. They were, and they really did very well. People started buying all these BMWs because they were getting great gas mileage. And they had great pickup, and yeah, the cars were really so sporty. Um, and they thought they were getting less, putting out less um, diesel exhaust and less pollution. That's what they were being told. So when the the IARC uh, carcinogenic classification came out, saying that diesel exhaust particulates are carcinogens, that was a problem for Volkswagen. So and here's a here's an email. This came out like a couple of days after the IARC thing. Um, from the corporate communication manager of Audi. Now, Audi's part of VW. It's the higher end of VW. Um, and he's asking folks up at the central office, any guidance you might be able to give regarding this World Health Organization, the source of the IRA the World Health Organization, that diesel is a carcinogen would help us counter the counter messaging. In other words, it's safe. You know, the bad messaging says that stuff causes cancer. We need to say, no, it doesn't. And there's no attempt to say, Let's figure out if it actually causes cancer. Um, so this would include studies that might contradict the report. So they say, oh yeah, we got to do something about this. We, you know, how are we going to create some studies that contradict the report? So the challenge, of course, with studies of cancer is you can't just throw together a study to find out a study that should be negative because it takes years to develop cancer. Um, and you, they really didn't want to use rats because there have been a number of rats studies already. So they said, well, 
and that you need people who are PR people, not scientists. Maybe we'll do a study that looks at not nitrogen oxides rather than the particulates, even though that obviously doesn't do the same in terms of messaging. So they said, okay, what we can do is we can just look at the, the not exposure, and so what we'll do is we'll put people in chambers and put them on bicycles, and we'll pump in knots from VW clean or clean engines versus ones from dirty engines, and we'll show that there's no really that there's the clean engines are really safe. But then someone pointed out, you know, the optics of having a German company pump gas into a, a chamber where the people in them wasn't going to do that well. So they decided to use monkeys, like non-human primates. So they went to a research facility in New Mexico that does uh, studies with monkeys as well as rats, called Lovelace. Um, and they gave them a big contract to do that same study. They didn't put the monkeys on bicycles, but they put the monkeys in chambers. And they actually had an infant monkeys watch TV, if you can call it, where they pumped in uh, some uh, emissions, but not the particulates, but the gas from engines. Um, here's the contract. Um, with the EUGT, which is this German trade association that's really run by Volkswagen, the guy who was doing it had a Volkswagen email address um, with Lovelace. They signed a contract in, uh, in um, $718,000. And with, so this is the interesting thing about a contract. It's something that hopefully the institution of the United States would no longer do, but um, it said we're going to be 50% now, 40% basis of the percent which gives the report. Um, and they said, we're going to keep everything confidential. You can't let anyone know what the results are. And you've got to keep it confidential for up to five years unless we decide to like, talk about it. So science, of course, all the major uh, medical journals will not let you publish an article if you agree that you won't um, we'll keep the results confidential or the will allow the sponsor to, to, um, to oversee it or to comment on it. That's the that side that they obviously didn't care about that. That was already a principle of all the major science journals when they did this contract. So they, they wrote this contract um, and they said, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to set up the system where we put monkeys in chambers, we're going to pump in three, right? the same monkey, this is a, a case crossover study, for those who studied this, where the same individual monkey gets clean air, gets filtered, uh, emissions from uh, clean, one of these new VWs, or from a 16-year-old Ford F-250 uh, pickup. Now, I, that's a picture of a little sort of uh, visual hyperbole. Maybe choose one that is pumping out like that. But that was the model. So they said, great. And um, VW says, you know, great, we're going to deliver, we'll, we'll bring you a new VW. And so this fellow, James Lang, who's the leader of diesel companies and VW from America, says, I'll bring the VW, and we'll set it up the same way we set it up in um, the emissions testing system, so you can put something into the back of the emissions test and see exactly what comes out. Of course, those of you who follow this know exactly where this is going. Um, later on, it was discovered that VW wrote software for their uh, engines that if it was being tested for emission, uh, emissions, essentially put out no emissions. But when it went on the road, it put out 40 times the amount of emissions, and these things were belching out nitrogen oxides and, and putting out, literally killing you know, hundreds of people as a result of that. But um, Lang, of course, didn't tell them that, and they didn't know that. And so you have a study that's being done, paid for by Volkswagen, that they've agreed to keep confidential, but it's great, right? The VW gives them, they think they're going to actually be looking at real emissions from a Volkswagen, but it's in fact these great emissions, so there will be almost no exposure. Len, by the way, eventually pled guilty and sentenced to 30 months in jail. Not for this, but for his overall involvement in the scandal. Um, at some point, the lovely scientists realized that you know, something's wrong. And it was only after it, the scandal came out that these defeat devices were on the VWs, because they look at this. Now, this is new technology diesel engine. That's the VW. Old technology diesel engine. That's the old Ford F-250. And you can see the exposure from the, the, uh, the NOx particles, the NOx emissions. They weren't that different between air and the clean VW. This is the, so this is uh, you know, 300 times higher um, 
the exposure from the um, from the fort. So you have a rigged study going on, but that doesn't stop them from moving forward because they still have to be paid, right? So they don't complain to VW that this is what happened. Um, but they do the study so badly that they find no difference between the um, exposure from the VW and from the Ford. And that's really only because they do the, the what they do, the lungs of the, the monkeys. It's a long story, but they do the bronchial lavage immediately, right before they do the testing. So everybody, all the monkeys have the same information, so they can't tell anything. So they, they say internally, the lavage data are garbage, um, but they're going to have to publish a paper anyway and throw out the lavage data. Um, so they don't, have, they don't have a study, but what's happening is they're under great pressure because they haven't been paid by Volkswagen. And Volkswagen saying, we can't, we're not going to pay you until you do the right thing, until you give us a study that gives us the results we want. Now, eventually the scandal hits and, and the people paying them go out of business, the, this trade association. And they publish, they send an abstract that we don't even mention that they did the, the VW. They just pretend that they built the Clean Air versus the Ford, which of course then they find that the Ford was worse for the Ford emissions were worse than Clean Air. So the Olasky study and the crisis and that portion of the But there you have sort of this, this basic idea that you had a company hiring scientists to do the wrong thing. And the scientists, and this, these are not people who are in business just as private defense experts, this is a real legit lab. You know, they're paid by Volkswagen to get the result, and they feel that they need to get the result. And there's a famous quote from Bob Dixon there, it's very difficult to convince a lab site when the salary depends on his not understanding. So they never said, Let's, you know, what's going on here? They continue to work to, to issue the report of the one This same problem of manufacturing uncertainty, you can see this across the board. You can see this in every sort of industry now. You can see it. Anyone see this movie, Dark Waters? Uh, the, the PFAS exposures in, in uh, West Virginia, well worth watching. It's the same set of issues around, and it's some of the same scientists who were brought in by DuPont to say that the exposures in water were safe, when eventually studies were done by epidemiologists who were jointly chosen by the two community and by DuPont. They showed increased risk of cancer, of high cholesterol, of thyroid disease, etc. and a bunch of different things. You see it across the board. Uh, it really has become standard operating procedure. Um, I think this has a lot of effects. Obviously, it has public health effects. But I think it affects science in general. It, it hurts the credibility of science. You need science to be respected and to be successful. And if we think, you know, for every scientific finding, there's an equal and opposite finding, and we really can't trust scientists because they never agree on anything. I think that really impacts the credibility of all scientists. Um, one of the reasons I wrote this book was that I saw that um, the same, the same uh, approaches, which are standard operating procedure now across corporations, have been totally embraced by the Trump administration. And in fact, those same scientists who I wrote about in the first book who were trying to influence agencies to do the wrong thing, now are being given power to run the agencies. So to give you one example, uh, Tony Cox, who's the chair of the EPA's Clean Air Science Advisory Committee. This is the advisory committee commissioned by Congress to look at all the data and to tell the EPA what to do in terms of basic uh, national and air quality standards. This is a, a very important committee at the top scientists in the country. They were mostly let go. Um, they were replaced by people who were not the same caliber. And his fellow Cox was given the chair. He had worked on ozone in particular before for the American Petroleum Institute. It was on record saying to over-regulate both ozone they're not really that dangerous. Um, silica, now when I was in Ocean Beach, a new silica standard that the workers from dust, this deadly dust that causes silicosis and lung cancer. He actually came to our hearing on behalf of the um, American Cancer Council and said that he reviewed all of our papers and he had not proven that silica causes silicosis. But the fellow from you know, the point of the epidemiologist said, <laughs> like he will say almost anything. Um, it's more like benzene, more like coal dust for the coal, coal industry. My favorite though was um, he was working for the Bayer the pharmaceutical company when they were trying to get uh, authorization to use a new sort of um, antibiotic for um, animals, for chickens, to overfeed um, poultry. Um, 
And this was during the George W. Bush administration. He, he submitted testimony on Meyer's behalf. And George Bush's commissioner threw out his testimony. He says his testimony lacked credibility, was unreliable, and potentially misquoted published articles. His testimony was so unreliable, it was inadmissible. He is now in charge of revising the government over there. It's one of many characters like this. Um, so this is, I think, a crisis. Well, we have to be out there defending science and defending the science underlying public health protections. Um, who pays for the price? Obviously, the most important price paid is by Americans, especially vulnerable people, children, older people, people with pre-existing conditions, with conditions uh, people in poor communities who are overexposed to toxic chemicals, where the government is rolling back their protections. Um, and that's a huge price. We're, we really are talking about tens of thousands of people being made sick and thousands of people. That's as a result of that. What's interesting is shareholders are starting to pay as well, and that may result in some change. Um, when corporations are caught manipulating the scientific evidence to avoid regulation, sometimes it comes back to bite them. Um, one example that's really been in the news recently was this issue about um, baby powder. Uh, talc is that's mined. Generally, the same mines have uh, fibers that are essentially like asbestos, and it's almost impossible to separate them out. Um, Johnson Johnson has declared that their baby powder has no asbestos for chronicles. Um, but recently, they had to recall 33,000 bottles of baby powder after regulators found asbestos. This was actually a laboratory that they, Jane, Jane had used found asbestos that uh, Jane Jay later claimed it was actually from a portable air conditioner that was brought into the room. That was believable. Um, but the, these lawsuits are occurring, and there's um, the reason is there are a number of studies. That are, this, the science is interesting. Um, the case control studies, there are about close to a dozen, I think, now that find an association between ovarian cancer and previous use of talcum powder. Um, the cohort studies do not find that. But um, there's, there's some reasonable debate over it. There was a lawsuit in Missouri where 22 women sued JJ, alleging their ovarian cancer was caused by Johnson's baby powder. And the women were, the jurors said yes, it did look like it was. Uh, they were awarded uh, $25 million each for their ovarian cancer. It sounds like a lot of money. But uh, the jurors looked at all the, the uh, memos and the evidence of J&J &J and the trade association essentially trying to cover up the issue and convince uh, government agencies not to regulate this as a carcinogen, not to even label the talc as potentially having uh, asbestos in them. And so the jurors were not given them, they were given those documents, um, and the documents were shocking. I'm just going to say the documents I saw when I testified. Um, and um, to give you an example of this, this is a uh, National Toxicology Program, which is the agency sort of like IARC, in that it, it issues classifications of different chemicals. Um, there are different exposures. And in the year 2000, it was considering uh, labeling asbestos or talc with asbestos particles as a carcinogen. And I was particularly interested in this. Uh, during the Obama administration, I was chair of the executive committee of the National Toxicology Program. I'm now a member of the Board of Scientific Counselors, which was, I was in the 2000. But you look at all these data, and essentially what came out were a lot of memos um, hired by the private hired by J&J &J and other firms, essentially say, how are we going to convince NTP not to call it a carcinogen? And um, the objective in these metals was to create a reasonable doubt in their minds. And it's, that's what they did. It was really quite impressive. In fact, the strategy was to come up with more confusion. And it's shocking to see them put out a paper, but that's what they did. And so when the jury saw that, um, they added an additional $4.1 million to the award. Uh, and the jurors told the press, they said, you know, we're trying to send a message so that J&J &J would appeal. Um, and J&J's market worth went down about $50 billion as a result of that piece of the other piece of the other piece. Um, And they're, now there are 14,000 lawsuits. You know, they, this could have been addressed very easily, not uh, very easily, but it could have been addressed 20 or 30 years ago. And it's all building up. In fact, in two weeks, there's a big FDA meeting on this. And the internal committee that's looked at this have essentially come back to the same thing and said, yes, there are asbestos particles in the topic. Um, glyphosate is another example. 
um, and helped with, with your epidemiology professor in there. Hear about this earlier. We worked on this when she was in IARC. Um, IARC issued a monograph saying um, glyphosate, which is a weed killer, um, is a probable carcinogen. So Monsanto, the manufacturer, launched a national, international campaign that's really pretty nasty, um, threatening uh, scientists, um, threatening, threatening to get the US government to cut off funding to the World Health Organization for working on this. Um, Monsanto did a lot of this under the table. They didn't talk about what they were doing. Um, all this came out in court cases, made them look terrible. Um, it really was embarrassing for Monsanto, or should have been. Um, what's interesting is then several workers sued us Sue Monsanto, these are people like ground support workers who are exposed to large amounts of chemical without non-conscious lymphoma, which appears to be related to glyphosate. And Monsanto's behavior drove the size of the awards. The first, um, there was a $250 million punitive damage award. Another one, the jurors actually looked at these papers. There was a husband and wife who developed non-conscious lymphoma. Um, and the jurors awarded the patient a billion dollars. Now, that's all under appeal, and they'll never see that money. I won't survive to the end of the In any case, but um, <laughs> when jurors look at what these companies did, they really uh, are furious. And now there are countless lawsuits pending. Um, and it has a big impact on these companies. So Bayer, for some unthinkable reason, while this was all going on, decided to buy Monsanto for $63 billion. So this, this particular merger or acquisition has been now called the worst corporate um, acquisition ever by a couple of different financial experts. Um, Bayer is now worth the same amount that it paid for Monsanto. So occasionally there's some uh, sort of financial justice in this, but it's often not the case. Um, we need to rethink how we deal with, with harmful exposures, not just chemicals, but in general, and how we deal with efforts. Um, I think right now we have to be thinking about very bold, Solutions. I think, and I think in some ways, because the Trump administration has so um, degraded our regulatory system, we're, we're, we're able to rebuild them at some point. And I think that needs to be done not to make it look like it used to do, but to take advantage of the fact that it really needs to be rebuilt and understand how to do it better so it's more effective. Um, the first point I think is we need scientific research, we need the best research possible, but it has to be directed by controlled by scientists without conflicts of interest. I think the polluters, the producers, the dangerous companies, other products, they should pay for the research, but they have to be able to, the research has to be totally independent. The other thing in terms of toxic chemicals, we have to move away from this idea that we have to do regulate chemical by chemical. You know, there, you know, we know something about these perfluorinated chemicals, you know, Teflon, and Vortex chemicals. We know something about them. There's one called PFOA, one called PFOS, and we know they cause illness in humans. And we're moving toward perhaps regulating them, there's a lot of opposition against that. There are 4,500 different chemicals in this category. And we have reasonable human evidence on two of them. You can't, you can't wait. We've got to move ahead um, and regulate these by class. And we have to essentially understand this idea that chemicals are not innocent or proof can be quick and it's presumption. So those are two basic points. We have a few minutes left for questions, so I'm grateful you invited me, and I'm happy to talk more about it. So thank you so much. some of this uh, on a regular basis, the asbestos, the talc issue. Uh, this gets to the heart of that. Uh, another example for your, your last comment, which is most telling in some ways, that we have to regulate by group. Uh, diacetyl, which is the artificial butter that was used to flavor popcorn, uh, there was a lot of regulatory activity. I served on a panel at one point, and as soon as data came out and the government was going to regulate it, they switched to another very much related chemical that did the same thing, which wasn't going to come under the regulation. 
And so this happens all the time. Uh, we, we call that regulatory whack-a-mole. Yeah. You know, so instead of dealing with all of those chemicals, you deal with them that way. And what's really, you know, so astonishing, I mean, we have so many problems in this country, and we have, as you pointed out, what's going on with our administration. But just take an issue like asbestos, over 60 countries of the world no longer allow it to be used in their country. And our current EPA put out documents this past year saying, we're going to look at the issue of seeing about new uses of asbestos. We can't use it the old ways, but we're going to look at new uses. Uh, and I think at the end of the day, as you pointed out, the only thing that's going to get these companies to stop doing it is to hit them in the pocket. That's, that's the only thing they know. Actually, the, that's in fact the lesson of the diacetyl example as well. The diacetyl causes something called popcorn lung. In the first case, it's worth having a popcorn, uh, microwave popcorn back in Missouri, where they started using it. This is a new formulation. All workers had their lungs destroyed and had lung cancer as a result of this. And then the cases came up with a bunch of different popcorn factories of bronchiolitis and literates. The industry was hit immediately by lawsuits. In fact, they were, between the awards and settlements, they had reached about $100 million. When I got to OSHA, one of my, the top things on my agenda was an issue with a um, standard on, on uh, diacetyl. But in fact, by then, even before it was on our agenda, the industry had moved away from it because the lawsuits, the lawsuits drove, it was, it was regulation by litigation. And, and you know, the industry had built a two, three pen dial, and so there was nothing to do. We didn't have enough evidence on that because the way that the laws were written, you actually have to have evidence showing that that one chemical causes illness. You couldn't regulate it. I'm told that we need to vacate the room uh, and maybe one minute so we have time for one more question. Like <laughs> <laughs> There's a class that's going to be here. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought we had till three. That's why. Uh, so did I. Um, so, uh, but I just want to remind everybody that immediately afterward there is a uh, reception outside here. So there's one well, ask questions. Ask questions. Uh, well. uh, thanks again for a stunning talk. Uh, and I also want to thank you for your bravery. And the question is, in doing what you do, especially during this time, how, if at all, um, have these industries impacted your own Career. These are places that give to public health in various wells, ways they have social um, fund arms, all sorts of things, and here you are putting up internal emails and, and so on. So I'm wondering if you feel that in any way career wise. No, I haven't. And I, appreciate it. I don't think I'm being particularly brave. You know, but I'm not in a. Uh, uh, maybe I've just been fortunate. I work for an institution that's uh, endowment for mostly in real estate rather than you know, so, you know, not. There are no major industrialists on the board of George Washington University. And before that, I used to teach at City College for Europe. But um, you do have to worry, um, and they certainly have gone after me. But on the other hand, you know, I think, you know, we're in public health, and this is, this is what this is about. You know, it takes a risk. You know, people, when I was in the ocean, people always thought I had a challenging job and a stressful job to take You know, all of us, you know, we're so privileged, but we're not working for the lines of skill levels. If the threat we face is because someone doesn't like what we say, you know, bring it on, right? Well, that's the thing. So thank you all so much.